Good evening, everyone. I'm so sorry uh, that I cannot meet with you this evening, uh, but I hope and pray that your readings and discussions at home this week have been encouraging and challenging at the same time. I can honestly tell you that I had no idea that our Sunday classes this week would tie so closely together with what we are reading for our class on Wednesday night. But isn't it awesome when God works things together like that? Uh, so as our Sunday class looked at Jesus uh, setting a pattern and Paul and the early church following that pattern, we are looking closer at the prayer life of Jesus. Remember, our goal is learning to pray like Jesus. We are focusing on when he prayed, who he prayed for, what he prayed for, and what happened when he prayed. And the first instance we see Jesus praying is at his baptism where God literally shows up in a very big and a very cool way. Luke uh, chapter 3, verses 21 through 23 says, When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Mark records this event as well and tells that uh, he saw heaven being torn open. And that Greek word torn, uh, shizo, appears again in Mark 15, 38, as the curtain is torn in two during the crucifixion. It is also similar to the Hebrew word in Isaiah 64, in verse 1, which says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And the following verses say that the mountains might quake at your presence. And when uh, fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries and that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. God the Father is declaring his presence at Jesus' baptism. His open accessibility and relationship by Jesus' sacrifice because of which we can access the throne of heaven in prayer. We come as humble servants and are treated as privileged companions. How wonderful is that? Anne Sprangler uh, writes about God's statements in Luke 3 verse 23 in her book, Sitting at the Feet of Rabbi Jesus. She says this, Father employs a pattern in this proclamation uh, that was very familiar to rabbis at the time called stringing pearls. This was a, a way of speaking uh, that brought together scripture patches, passages from different parts of the Old Testament and combines them in a new way to, or, in order to reveal great truths. You are my son comes from Psalms 2 and verse 7. Whom I love comes from Genesis 22 and verse 2. And with you I am well pleased from Isaiah 42 and verse 1. Thus, in three, in three quotes from the Old Testament, God speaks of Jesus as a king, a servant, and his son who will become a sacrifice. When God speaks, he packs a lot into his words. Whether you are riding Springer's train of thought or not, God clearly delivers a powerful message to Jesus following his prayer. Direct words of identity and affirmation, of emotional connection and encouragement. What is so amazing is that God desires to speak those words to us as well if we will just pray and listen. From here, Jesus is led into a time of fasting and praying, the content of, the content of which we, we don't have, but we do know that Satan direct attacks following uh, this time will focus on God's previous statement about uh, who Jesus was, using the words, if you are the Son of God. See, if Jesus spends 40 days in prayer and fasting before launching his ministry, the obvious outcome for us who are striving to be like Jesus is that we should have focused prayer and fasting over our identity and the ministry that we engage in, because that's where Satan will try to attack us. I want to encourage you to, to feel free to pause the video at, at this point and to contemplate or discuss with those that you're with the impact here for our life. 
as we pray uh, and, and focus about our lives and the ministry that we should be engaged with um, and, and where your life is engaged in ministry and, and maybe where that needs to grow or, or what God is doing through you, um, I truly believe that if we listen as we pray, that God breaks through the barriers and that his presence is made known and that he speaks to our to our hearts and, and to our soul. Luke 5.16 seems to indicate that prayer for Jesus was a habitual practice as it says that he often withdrew to lonely places to pray. Similar phrasing is used in Mark 6 in verse 31 as Jesus invites his disciples to a quiet place for rest after a busy day. Jesus is teaching the disciples and us the important lesson of getting away to pray and doing it often. A lesson that the Spirit of God had already taught him about spending time alone with Father. So even when the days were full of good work, Jesus made time for God. Mark 1 verse 35 notes that Jesus got up early at o dark 30 after being up late with the people. Time with Father was more important to Jesus than time to sleep. If you couldn't find Jesus, it was a safe bet that he was somewhere praying. Even Judas, as he was looking for a time to hand Jesus over, he knew he could find Jesus in the garden praying. Corey Boom is quoted as saying, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment and keep it. A man is powerful on his knees. And so, you know, here, here's another question to pause the video and consider. Do your closest relationships know your habits of prayer? What would it look like for you to grow in a daily routine of prayer like Jesus? You know, if you have a moment to, to talk about those things and it begins to open the, our eyes and, and the doors for us about what and where our prayer life is. Not only does Jesus have a regular habit of prayer, but we also see him praying before big life changing decisions. In John chapter 6 and verse 15, realizing that the crowd of 5,000 uh, who was just fed miraculously, was about to force him to be king, Jesus withdraws again to a mountain by himself. In Mark 14 and Mark 6, or Matthew 14, I'm sorry, and Mark 6, uh, speak of the same account and say that Jesus withdrew in order to pray after sending off the disciples and dispersing the crowd. Later in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, we see Jesus spending the entire night in continued prayer towards God, uh, before he selects the uh, 12 disciples um, who, who would become his apostles, who would continue to preach and minister among the growing crowds. What do you think was the content of these prayer marathons? What do you think Jesus spoke with the Father about? We have to infer a little bit, but we can, we can kind of guess by the events that happen around these uh, that Jesus was praying about the, the changes in life and the direction that life was about to take. What life decisions do you need to spend extended times in prayer about? What things have we been doing maybe on your own efforts and your own abilities and not taking the time to pray that God guides through those life changes? Because many of the life changes that Jesus makes uh, out of obedience and devotion to the Father, we could expect to know that life was not easy for the Son of God. Messianic passages like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 69 speak to this suffering even as a child before his public ministry started. There is this idea that Jesus was different than other children and young men because of his devotion to the things of God. And how do many children treat others who are just a little bit different? It's safe to say that Jesus may have felt feelings of, of discourse, feelings of uh, awkwardness, uh, even rejection. 
see, it's it's hard for us to, uh, or actually easy for us to to consider those things taking place. But what's hard for us is asking this question of how did Jesus respond to those who were treating him differently? And I believe this because of prayer that guides him into how he interacted with other people. See, in John chapter 14, verse 13, we see Jesus in deep emotional, personal pain as he hears the news of his cousin, John the Baptist, being murdered. And where does he turn? To prayer, of course. Yet in his pain and grief, the crowds find him. And instead of pushing them away, Jesus is moved with compassion to love, serve, and feed them all. Prayer has this beautiful beautiful way of redirecting our thoughts and actions outward, even in our most personal moments. One of my new favorite connections with prayer has been my discovery of the reticular activating system. And of course, I didn't discover this system, uh, but I, I, as I learned about this system in our, in our brain, see, just under the soft spot at the back of our neck on the inside is where this reticular activating system um, is, it, the RAS. And, and what this system does is it acts as a filter for our brain, that there is so much stimuli all around us that if our brains did not filter that out, we would quite literally go insane. And so our brain filters out uh, what it, the rest of the brain will then, will then process. Prayer uh, reforms the reticular activating system in our brain. And this, these studies that I've, that I've read about this um, are, are just amazing. And I get caught up in all the science and the psychology of this, but you know, the, the reticular activating system is what makes you see um, blue Toyota pickup trucks when you buy a blue Toyota pickup truck. Uh, you know, it's what, for, for some odd reason, you begin to see those all the time. Well, that's because something has triggered that in the RAS to be, to be allowed to pass through and processed. And prayer trains that system so that when I pray for uh, ways to uh, reach out to my neighbor, the reticular activating system opens up to opportunities that I have to see my neighbor. So as I pray for ways to share the message of Jesus with my neighbor, all of a sudden I start seeing my neighbor at the mailbox more often. It wasn't that he wasn't there before and, or that I was never there at the same time. It's just now that prayer has changed this system in, in my brain that I am processing and becoming more aware of it. I love this connection. See, John 13 verse 1, if we get back to Jesus, tells us that Jesus loved his own and loved them to the very end. Who has God placed in your life that you love deeply? Maybe children or parents, friends or co-workers or neighbors. We need to identify and pray for these individuals and allow the Holy Spirit to to train our RAS uh, system in our brains that, that we may love and care for these individuals the way that Jesus did. I believe that's what was taking place as Jesus was praying in those moments, that his, his focus and his attention went back to his mission of loving and serving and, and reuniting those who are lost with Father in heaven. I love Jesus' prayer in John 17 as well. And I hope you had or will take time to dwell in it. There Jesus prays for his disciples and models for us what we should do and how we should be praying for others. He prays about revealing the Father um, that they may know him in verse 6. He prays about giving them the words that, that the Father has given him in verse 8. He simply states that he lifts them up in prayer in verse 9. He prays for the protection and safety uh, in verse 12. He prays for their being sent and their, their mission in verse 18, uh, that they are sent just as he was sent from the Father. 
You praise for their for sanctification in verse 19. And you praise for his and their glory in verse 22. And we can spend some time in, in chapter 17 of John and 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 look at how Jesus prays and then model our life to pray like Jesus. Again, I pray that looking at the prayer life of Jesus is encouraging and challenging for you. Encourages you uh, to, to know that, that we can and we are allowed to pray just like Jesus did. That we can have a life of prayer the same that he did. And challenges us that where our prayer life is now and how Jesus is our measuring stick and where our prayer life can be. Prayer is at the root of spiritual maturity, health, and balance as we strive to walk like Jesus. So take a step in his direction today and each day. Guys, I, I apologize again that, that today was not a discussion and hopefully we can discuss a little next week before we begin looking at how we can live obedient like Jesus as well. I pray you have a great evening and an even better ending to your week. And maybe something that you can do since uh, since uh, this week we're not meeting together is if you remember somebody who has been joining us in class together to give them a call and and pray with them or just discuss some of the things that you have learned from this week's readings. Again, have a great week, and I look forward to seeing you again. God bless. Amen.